Oh, good morning. Good morning. What a great morning already. A great morning of worship, of being in the Lord's house and being in His presence. I'm so excited about what God is teaching us. Have you ever thought that your life is a product of the daily decisions that you make? Your life is a product of the daily decisions you make. And are you drawing closer to the Lord with every decision you make, or are you moving further away? And that's what we're talking about in this series called Next Steps. We're we're talking about that we can take steps and become the men and women that God created us to be, that God is drawing us to himself, that God is inviting us into this relationship, that God longs for us. He has an incredible plan for us, but God is inviting us to take our next step in our spiritual journey. And it's a commitment process of reaching out, of growing up, of giving all, and becoming who God intends for us. And I'm excited about what God's teaching us because God is challenging us that we step out and that's an individual step, but we do it in the context of community. That we lock arms and we go forward together, that we're not alone in this world. And we have a God who is for us and we have people that will walk with us. And it makes the next steps so exciting. Now in our series, we've been tracking with the people of God back in the Old Testament. We've been looking at their story, their story of obedience, their story of faith, their story of taking their next steps. And we saw how God blessed them in an incredible way. He brought them out of Egypt. He took them into this land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land. He gave them houses they didn't build, vineyards they didn't plant. And they got into the land and things were great for a while. They built the temple, the place in the center of their community to say, God, you're number one. You know, we want you to be lifted up. But then after a while, their daily decisions led them away. After a while, they saw the gods of this world, little G, and they they fell in love with the money and the power and success, and, and they forgot about the God who was at the center of their hearts. They forgot about worship, and slowly they drifted off track. But God didn't give up on them. I love that, right? God didn't give up on them. He would started drawing them back, and he said, in fact, as a loving parent, he said, I'm going to put you in time out for a little while. So you think about your decision so that you understand the depth of my love for you. And so sure enough, you know, they were conquered by the Babylonians. They were taken off into exile and they stayed in Babylon. And and there they were. They were hurting. They were broken. They were afraid. They were lonely. But during that time, God was working on their hearts. And God was saying, you are my people and I love you. And so then in 538 BC, he raised up a guy named Cyrus, who was the king of Persia, came in. If you know world history, the Persians conquered the Babylonians. And then in this first year, Cyrus issued this proclamation, Israelites, you can go home. You can go, it was unbelievable because that never happened. Once you were conquered, you were done. But 50,000 people turn around and they walk out of captivity and they come back to Jerusalem. And the first thing they do, they start to rebuild the temple, right? First thing they do is they say, we want God at the center of our community. We want God at the center of our lives. Just like Jesus said later on, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Put God first. Hold on to him first. And so they did and they laid the foundation for the temple. And then obstacles started to come. Opposition arose. There were people in the land. There was this governor, this leader of the Trans Euphrates, and uh, you know he started giving them a hard time. What are you doing? Why are you getting so passionate about God? You know, and we have those obstacles in our lives. We we start to step out for God, and people go, "What are you doing? You know, what what's going on with you?" And and instead of keeping up and doing the work, the people went back to their homes. And they started rebuilding their homes and they made them bigger and bigger and nicer and nicer. And for 18 years, the work on the temple stopped. And then God called two prophets in 520 BC, Haggai and Zechariah. And these two prophets preached a sermon series and said, guys, it's time for us to take our next steps. It's time for us to come back and to finish the work that God has started in us. And so the, sure enough, they came back. Everybody rallied together as one man. You know, they came back and they all like, you know, they were ready. They were going at it and they were working hard. And the opposition came up again. What are you doing? <laughs> but this time they didn't stop. This time they said, we don't care what you say. We're following God. We're making him the Lord of our life, the Lord of our home, the Lord of our community. He's number one and we are going with him. And the opposition said, fine, we'll send a letter off to the king, the king of Persia, King Darius, and he'll stop this. And they said, you can send your letter all you want because we're going to pray and our God is greater. And so let's see what happens. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you up with me to the book of Ezra. 
Ezra, Old Testament. Oh, it's so good. I love the Word of God. Ezra chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, maybe you have a mobile device, you can access the Scriptures online at Version. Track along with us or we'll put the words on the screen as we unpack the Word of God today. Ezra chapter 6. Ezra chapter 6. And let's pick up here in verse 1. And here's the first thing I want you to know. If you're taking notes today, look at this. God blesses as we are faithful to Him. God blesses as we are faithful to Him. The people wouldn't stop the work. The people kept God first in their lives. They said, go ahead and send your letter. And look what happens. Chapter 6, verse 1. King Darius, right? There was King Cyrus who was the king over the Persian Empire. He conquered the Babylonians, the Assyrians. So he was the king over all of those empires. And now Darius is the one who follows him. King Darius then issued an order. And they searched in the archives stored in the treasury at Babylon. And a scroll was found in the citadel of Ecabanta in the province of Media, and this was written on it. Now, we know from archaeology that the Babylonians and the Persians had extensive libraries. In fact, many of documents have been found. And you can go back and search this and research, uh, and they would keep this. Because if a king issued a proclamation, you know, here you are 18 years later, and you are going, hey, what did the king say? You know, let's Google it. I mean, you couldn't do that back then, right? So, you know, it's like, go to the royal library, find out what the king issued, And they went and they found it. And here's what they wrote. Memorandum, verse 3. In the first year of King Cyrus, the king issued a decree concerning the temple of God in Jerusalem. Let the temple be rebuilt as a place to present sacrifices and let its foundations be laid. It is to be 90 feet high and 90 feet wide with three courses of large stones and one of timbers. The costs are to be paid by the royal treasury. Also the gold and silver articles of the house of God which Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar was the one who came in, he conquered uh, Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, 586 BC, took from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, are to be returned to their places in the temple in Jerusalem. They are to be deposited in the house of God. So they find this document and they take it to Darius and they go, here you go, Darius, this is what Cyrus proclaimed should happen. And now then, here's Darius. He says, now then, Tantania, governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Shetha Bazani, and you, their fellow officials of that province, stay away from there. Okay, these are the guys who are opposing the work. And the king issues this decree. You stay away from there. You let them do this. Do not interfere with the work on this temple of God. Let the governor of the Jews and the Jewish elders rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I hereby decree that you are to do for these elders of the Jews in the construction of the house of God. The expenses of these men are to be fully paid out of the royal treasury from the revenues of the trans-Euphrates so that the work will not stop. Whatever is needed, young bulls, rams, male lambs, or for burnt offerings, to the God of heaven, and wheat, salt, wine, and oil, as requested by the priest in Jerusalem, must be given them daily without fail." so that they may offer sacrifices pleasing to God of heaven and pray for the well-being of the king and his sons. Furthermore, I decree that if anyone changes this edict, a beam is to be pulled from his house and he is to be lifted up and impaled on it. And for this crime, his house is to be made a pile of rubble. May God who has caused his name to dwell there. I love that, right? He says, may God who has caused his name. I mean, Darius, Cyrus, all those guys, they recognize that God is sovereign over all creation. God who caused his name to dwell there, overthrow any king or people who lifts a hand to change this decree or to destroy this temple in Jerusalem. I, Darius, have decreed it. Let it be carried out with diligence. Amazing, okay? I mean, this is incredible. You see, when you are following God and you are faithful to God, God blesses. Does it mean there's obstacles? Yes. Does it mean there's challenges? Yes. But what it also means is that that is where you see God do miracles, That's where you see God come through in amazing ways. And that's what the people saw, right? I mean, they're rebuilding the temple. The opposition sends off this letter. Think about all the things that these people experienced. One, they experienced freedom, right? I mean, they were slaves. They were in captivity. Once you're conquered, you're done. And now they're back in their homeland. Seventy years later, just like God had prophesied, just like God had told them, they're back. They're rebuilding the temple. Secondly, they have the permission of the king to rebuild the temple. Hey, rebuild the temple. Rebuild your homes. Moreover, did you hear this? I love this. Moreover, all of their expenses are to be paid from the royal treasury. So he's saying, you opposition, you pay for the work now. 
And be sure that they have young bulls or rams, but also wheat, salt, wine, and oil. Make sure that they're kind of taken care of. I mean, make sure that they've got enough wine, you know, and things are good and they're happy so that they will pray for the king and his sons because we know he is the one true God. And then the king says this. The king says, in fact, if any of you want to oppose the work, may a beam be pulled from your house and may you be lifted up and impaled on it. Now, that doesn't sound like a great way to die to me. You know, I don't know, being pulled from your house. But these people knew that Darius was serious because if you go back and study history, there was a revolt that happened in Babylon and Darius, in fact, killed 3,000 Babylonians by pulling a beam from their house and impaling them on it. So these guys knew, okay, this guy's serious. And uh, all of a sudden, the message came. And the people are like, yes, God is with us. God is for us. And the opposition is now funding the rebuilding project. I mean, it was unbelievable. But you know what? When I thought about this, I thought what an amazing story of God's blessing in their life. But we all have a story like that. I mean, seriously, we all have a story that's that incredible in our lives. Because you see, when you and I gave our lives to Jesus Christ as God was drawing us to himself, God invited us into this relationship with him. And the Bible says that before we were dead in our sins and our transgressions, we had no hope to have eternal life. But God made us alive in Christ. When we were slaves to sin, God blessed us and gave us freedom. And he brought us out of that darkness and into his wonderful light. And then moreover, God just kept blessing. I mean, you think about your life. You think about the way that God has blessed you. Many of us, our big decision today is going to be, hey, what restaurant should I go to? (laughs) You know? I mean, he has lavished on us resources, food. He has lavished on it. We go to our closets and try to pick out clothes. Half the world lives on less than $2 a day. Why has God blessed us so much? And we begin to look and we begin to concentrate so many times on our problems and our obstacles and they're there and they're real, yes. But God is saying through it all, I am for you. I am with you and I'm not gonna give up on you. There is nothing in this world that is greater than me. You hold on to me and you realize that I'm fighting for you. You realize that you are blessed and it's to be a blessing. We have this story in our lives. I love that. And every day we ought to wake up and just go, God, thank you for the breath of my lungs. God, thank you. I have a roof over my head. God, thank you for the food that I have to eat. But God, thank you that I have a Savior who died for me, that my eternity is secure, that the best is yet to be, that God, you are with me. And when that reality sets in, man, it changes the way we live. And the people experience that miracle, and you and I, through Christ, by the grace of God, experience that miracle of redemption, of hope, of life, of joy, of peace, of salvation. And there's nothing like it. But you know what? You and I as a people, as a people of God here at Rolling Hills, we've got a story like this. I mean, it's amazing. We do. We have a story like this. It's awesome. You see, five years ago, we were at a church meeting in a movie theater. Five-year-old church, right? The average age of our congregation, 27 years old. And we were, you know, so thankful. I mean, we were setting up and tearing down. We were working hard. And every week, uh, we would get there. and We would get to the theater early at 6.30. And we'd be putting out baby beds and rocking chairs. And, and, and then as soon as the, you know, our time was over, the movies would start on the screen. And we're grabbing everything. And we're running out the door. We never had a contract at the movie theater. We went through four different general managers. We never knew if we were going to show up. And they would say, you couldn't be here. And we just never knew. But we knew God was faithful. We knew that we just were supposed to do what God had called us to do, and we trusted God. And, and I'll never forget, after five years, we said, okay, God, um, we know you have something else. And God said, you take your next step, and you trust me. And, and we said, well, God, we don't know, really know where we're going to go. We don't know what's going to happen. And he said, no, 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 you just trust me. As a congregation, trust me. And we said, okay. And so in one Sunday, we called it Wildest Dreams 1. And one Sunday, we just said, hey, everybody, stretch. Let, let's come and give God. We don't have any money, so let's just, you know, out of our, what God's blessed us with, let's just come and give back. And in that one Sunday, here's the average age of the congregation, 27, right? You know, five-year-old church. And in one Sunday, we came, we had an altar built. We just, we just laid gifts on the throne. We just said, God, it's all you. You take it, you multiply it, you do what you want to with it. 
And on that one Sunday, the church gave $1 million. I mean, I mean, there's no way to explain it. It's like the fish and the loaves. It was like we took a little, we just placed it in the hands of God, and God goes, watch this. I mean, just watch this. And then God gives us this giant warehouse, you know. He's like, here you go, check it out. And he gives us, and then he says, moreover, I'll give you three tenants who will help pay for the mortgage. And we're just like, what? You know, I mean, you just can't outgive God. I mean, you can't. And when you follow him, when you trust him, I mean, you know, you just see God do miracles. But what happens so many times is we start the work and we lay the foundation and then the obstacles come. And many times we're like, oh, yeah. And our mind shifts from God and our mind shifts to how are we going to do this and what's going to happen. And, and we fall away and it's those daily decisions that move us and drift us away. And God's going, no, 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 no. You stay faithful. You hold on to me. In the good times and the tough times, you hold on to me because I'm sovereign over all. And I will do immeasurably more. You just trust. You know what? God wants to do that in your life. I believe it from the bottom of my heart. I believe in your life the best is yet to be. And you hold on to him. And a lot of times what happens is we start to work for God. And then we think, oh, but I failed in the past. I I dropped the ball in the past, you know. And Satan comes along and starts reminding us. That's why the work sat empty for 18 years. They started the work. And then they were like, oh, but we're so busy building our own homes. We're so busy doing our own thing. And Satan was reminding them, you tried this before and you failed. And maybe in your life you go, well, you know, I've tried to get serious about God and uh, it just hasn't worked. You know, I've tried to read my Bible and I've tried to pray and uh, it just doesn't work. You know what you say? Get behind me, Satan. My God is a God of grace and his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And it's a new day and a new opportunity and I'm going forward with God. Last week I told a story about a, a woman in our church and one of my favorite people, I just love her. Her name's Maureen, and a friend, a coworker, invited her to church. She hadn't been in years, years since she was a child, and here she is in her, in her early 40s, and, and she, you know, I was telling you about how she accepted Christ, how she was baptized in just her life, and now she's a leader in the church. She invited her sister-in-law to church, her sister-in-law who's an attorney who's now been to Moldova seven times in the last three years and working with orphans. Just Transformation. And after I told the story, Maureen emailed me and she said, Jeff, here's part two of the story. She said, I've always regretted that I didn't, you know, give my life to Christ earlier. And I have three grown children and I've always regretted that, you know, I didn't get to tell them about Jesus or raise them in a Christian home. And, and like so many parents who have that, that privilege and that opportunity. And she goes, every time I, I start to talk to my kids, it's like I, I'm just reminded of this. And then this Christmas, my, my kids were home and and we all came to the Christmas Eve service, but she said, I was talking to my oldest son and his wife. And his wife grew up in a home where they were nominally Buddhist, and, but they didn't really have any religion. And my son who said, you know, mom, we didn't go to church. I don't really know anything about Jesus or, or you know, Christianity. And now that we have a child, they looked at me and they said, mom, would you teach our daughter about Jesus? Would you teach our child about what it means to be a Christian? And she just wrote, she goes, I couldn't believe it. There was so much joy that God was giving me a chance that God was allowing me to take this next step in my family. But there was so much fear of going, I don't know a whole lot. I haven't been a Christian that long. But I'm so excited to see what God is doing in this next step in my life. She said, that's part two of my story. I can't wait to see what part three is going to (laughs) be. I said, I can't either. You know, what is God going to do? What's God going to do? It says in the book of Psalms, and I love this psalm, Psalm 37, verse 23 and 24. If the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. Though he stumbles, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. You know what? When you step out, I want to tell you, your step may feel uncertain, but God is certain. (laughs) That step may feel uncertain, but God is certain. And you step out in him, and you follow him, and you be obedient, and you be faithful, and you watch God do what only God can do. Here's number two. I want you to see this. God calls us to finish his work. God calls us to finish his work. Look at verse 13. Then because of the decree King Darius had sent, Tatania, governor of the trans-Euphrates, and Shetha Bazani and their associates carried it out with diligence. I'm sure they did, right? They didn't want to be impaled. <laughs> They're like, okay, we'll do it. So the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai 
and the prophet and Zechariah, a descendant of Ido. They finished building the temple according to the command of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month, Adar, in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Then the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. For the dedication of this house of God, they offered a hundred bulls, two hundred rams, four hundred male lambs, and as a sin offering for all of Israel, twelve male goats, one for each of the tribes of Israel. And they installed the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their groups for the service of God at Jerusalem according to what is written in the book of Moses. Can you imagine the joy? Can you imagine that these people who've been in captivity have come back now and 18 years later they finished building the temple? Can you imagine as they put the last stone on, they just went, woo, you know, and they're high five and they're just so excited. The temple was finished, we know from scripture, on March 12th, 516 BC. March 12th, 516 BC. And this is the temple that stood for the next 600 years. This is the temple that stood where Jesus was dedicated. This is the temple that stood where, where Jesus worshiped. 600 years, their faithfulness, their obedience to finish God's work, to take their next step, to be a part of the journey. And God did immeasurably more. And God wants to do that in your life. I love what the prophet Jeremiah wrote. Jeremiah 29, and he says this. He's writing a letter. This is about 100 years earlier, and he's writing to them while they're in exile. And while these people feel like they have no chance or no hope, Jeremiah writes a letter to them and he says, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. The temple was destroyed in 586 BC. It was rebuilt in 516 BC. Exactly 70 years. This was written 100 years before that. 70 years, God fulfilled his promise. And then Jeremiah says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. What an incredible promise. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And maybe today you feel like, man, my life, I, I just feel like I'm trapped. I feel like I'm in captivity. I feel like things are hard or difficult. Call out to the Lord. <laughs> Call out to the Lord. You, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Call out to him. Seek him because God is here for you. God wants the best for you. God believes in you. And like Jeremiah said to him, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future God has a hope and a future for you. God has plans that you can't even imagine yet for you. And God's calling all of us to take a next step. In this series, Next Steps, we're challenging one another. What does it mean to take a next step and reaching out, growing up, giving all? And so this week, we've been having some of our staff going around to different small groups and, and listening to people. And, and I've loved hearing people talk about their next steps. I was with a guy this week and he said, hey Jeff, I don't have a Bible. He said, I want to do that Bible reading plan, you know, with the 24 month, but, but I don't have a Bible. He said, where should I go? And we talked about going to Lifeway. And he said, what translation, NIV or the Holman Christian Standard? You know, we, we talked about these things. And he goes, I'm just excited. And maybe you're here today and you don't have a Bible. That's okay. Out there in the gallery, we have an information area. We have free Bibles for you. We'll just give you a Bible today. Jump on board because I'm telling you, when you start reading the Word of God, <laughs> your life is going to be changed. I talked with a guy this week. And he said, Jeff, here I am in my 30s. He said, I gave my life to Christ when I was 15. And he said, you know what? I, I knew then, you know, I'm saved. I know I'm going to go to heaven. But for whatever reason, God keeps talking to me about being baptized. And I haven't done it. And I keep putting it off. I keep putting it off. He said, but you know what my next step is? I'm going to be baptized. And he said, I'm making that commitment not so that, I, you know, I go to heaven one day. He said, I'm making that commitment because I know I'm going to go to heaven. And God is with me. And it's just an outward expression of my faith. But I'm also making that commitment because I have two boys and I want them to see their dad following Jesus. I want them to see their dad taking a step of faith in, in his life. I was like, that's a great reason. <laughs> you know, that's amazing. I talked with another guy this week. He said, hey, I've never been out of the country, but I'm going on my first mission trip. I signed up to go to Moldova this summer. He goes, I'm scared to death, but I'm going. 
He goes, I can't wait to see what God's going to do. I, I talked with another guy. He said, you know what? I, I just feel like I'm called to be the husband and father that God called me to be. He said, to be honest with you, work has been my God. It's been all about work for me, and it's been all about money and how much money I can make. And, and he said, my next step is to pour into my spouse and pour into my family. I went, way to go. Great job. I talked to a lady this week who said, hey, we're going to open our home for a backyard Bible club. We're, we're going to do something to reach out to our community. You know what? Just story after story. And it's your story. It's our story together. You know, in my life, I'm, God's calling me to take a next step. I mean, he is. And Lisa and I have been talking about it. We've been praying about it. You see, there's never a point where you go, okay, God, I've arrived. You know the word retirement's not in the Bible, by the way? So just say if you're here in your 60s, 70s, or 80s, and you think, hey, I'm, you know, God's kind of done with me. No, 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 no. God's calling all of us. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. It's about following him. And I'm called to take a next step. And as I look at this and reaching out, you know, to reach out. And, and I go on a mission trip every year. I, I go to, to give, but what happens is my life is impacted. My life has changed. We've also looked around our neighborhood. We live in a great neighborhood, but we've said, you know, there's a lot of people here who probably don't know Jesus. There's a lot of people at our kids' school. How do we reach out to our neighborhood? That's important for us. Growing up, we're reading through the Bible. You know, I've, I've been baptized. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm so passionate about Christ, a member of the church. But we want to read through the Bible the next 24 months. I've read through it multiple times, but I want to with my family. I want to with my girls. I want to be able to talk about it, process with them. And giving all, you know what? We, we tithe, we give. But we want to make a one-time gift next week. We want to make a 24-month pledge. We're going to do both of those because we're committed to what God's doing in this place. And we know we're called to take a next step. We know we're called to be a part of what's happening here for the glory of God. And you know what, church? Our obedience is going to impact generations. Our obedience and what we do next week is going to impact generations. Let me just tell you this. Every Sunday morning, there's about 500, 500 kids here between birth through 18. Between preschool, children, middle school, and high school, 500. Last Sunday, there were 50 kindergartners alone, just one class, 50 kindergartners. Last Sunday at 9.30, there were 24 two-year-olds in one class. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if you were the teachers? Praise God for you. <laughs> I'm thankful for you. 24 two-year-olds. It's awesome. It's amazing. But God has said, look, you've got 15,000 square feet of unfinished space. Finish the work. Finish it. There's a generation that needs to know about me. Preschool area. Can you imagine children's area and students having their own classrooms or breakout rooms? Think about this. Who's going to tell the next generation about Jesus if we don't? The government? Schools? Who's going to make an impact in the next generation around here if we don't? Who's going to step up not only for our kids, but for our kids' friends and for our kids' future spouses, maybe? For who's going to impact them for the glory of God if we don't? But it's not just the kids who come here to Rolling Hills. You know what? There's a, a place that we work over here called Franklin Estates, and we go and we serve. We do the PATH Project. It's amazing what's happening over there. And the kids' test scores are going through the roof. 2,000 people live in this area. And, the, and the, the community is literally giving us a building. And they're saying, hey, if you can finish it out, you can use it. What would it look like to have multiple days of tutoring happening there through the PATH Project? What would it like to offer ESL classes and GED classes and financial peace classes? And, and to be able to say, we want to come alongside to transform a community. It's, it's not just that. You know what? One of our tenants is, is the state of Tennessee. All our foster care for Williamson County comes through our building. All of foster care. Now, now think about this. When DCS is called and, and they get this call from somebody whose parents have died, or they get this call that the parents have been taken off to jail, and there's a kid, and they go over and they pick up that child. They bring that little boy or little girl to our building. And they get on the phone and they start calling for people to see if somebody will take them for a couple of weeks or short term or even a long term but somebody step in and help. That happens right here. Now, whenever a family finally says, yes, we'll do that, and they'll come and get the child, it takes 10 to 30 days for the state to get the funding so that they can have food and clothes and all this for this little child. What if, what if church, 
We have a center set up. So as soon as they walk out that door with this child, they walk right in and they can have food and they can have clothes and they can have resources right here, day one, at the beginning. And we can come around and we can pray over that family and says that God has a hope and a future for you. That's what we're called to do. What does it look like over in South Nashville? We have a new campus over there. God's moving in a mighty way. What does it look like in a... In a zip code where there's 60 different nationalities, where the world is literally coming to us. Well, what does it look like over in Moldova where you have precious orphan children and we work in 11 different orphanages, probably 275, 300 kids being sponsored. We have transitional living homes there for kids. But we have about 30 kids in the transitional living home and that's just a drop in a bucket compared to how many kids are in this country. You know, Moldova is right next to the Ukraine. There's a lot happening there. There's a lot of fear and worry and anxiety. And God says, you, church, be my hands and my feet. What does it look like in the Amazon? We had a pastor's conference with 35 amazing, wonderful pastors, 35 different villages. But do you realize that there's 80,000 villages along the Amazon? We've got a long way to go and a lot to do. And God says, you finish my work. You keep going with every breath that you have for my name and my glory in your day and in your generation. You be faithful. And then look at number three. Number three, if you're taking notes. God receives the glory when we take our next steps together. God receives the glory. It says on the 14th day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the Passover. The priests and the Levites had purified themselves and were all ceremonially clean. The Levites slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the exiles, for their brothers and the priests, for themselves. So the Israelites who had, remembered, who had returned from the exile ate it together with all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. For seven days they celebrated with joy the Feast of Unleavened Bread because the Lord had filled them with joy by changing the attitude of the king of Assyria so that he assisted them in the work on the house of God, the God of Israel. Man, love this. For seven days, they celebrated with joy. For seven days, they gave God all the glory because he changed the heart of the king. He's the one who worked. He's the one who brought them. He's the one who delivered them. He's the one who gave them freedom. They said, it's God. And we want our lives to bring glory to God. Every step we take, we want God to be honored. We want God to be glorified. We want lives to be changed. You know what they did? They celebrated the Passover. The Passover is so special. The Passover was when the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. And God said, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to strike the Pharaoh with 10 plagues. And he's going to let you go on the 10th plague. And back then, the 10th plague came and the Pharaoh kept saying, no, I'm not letting you go. I'm not letting you go. And here comes the 10th plague. And God said to his people, hey, you kill a lamb and you put the blood over the doorpost of your home. That sounds gross to us today, but back then that was what they did. And, you know, it was just the way they lived and they kill lambs, they eat it and all that. But they put, they put the blood over the doorpost of their home. And that night, the death angel came. And the death angel passed over the homes that were covered by the blood. You know, the Passover was a time of remembrance of God's deliverance, of God's grace. The Passover was a time of commitment. As they said, we trust God and we're going forward in God we want God to be at the center of our lives, God at the center of our community. Today we share communion because it's the blood of Christ that covers our lives. And it's the death angel who passes over us because we have new life in Christ. We have hope. We will live for eternity because God is with us. See, Jesus said, when you are faithful with little, I'll give you more. When you take your next steps of faith and you follow me, just remember I'm with you. I've always been with you and I will always be with you. And you make a commitment to go forward in me. You make a commitment to trust me. I want to ask this. If you're here today, if you're here today and you were around, we did that Wildest Dreams One offering and you trusted God, you stepped up and you gave, you were a part of that Wildest Dreams One offering back in the theater. If you're here today, would you just stand up wherever you are all across this room? Would you just stand up? Wow. <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart. You, stay standing just for a second. Stay standing just for a second. 
If you were here in Wildest Dreams 2, when we moved in the building, we realized we need to finish out some space for kids and all. If you were part of that, would you just stand up right where you are? Right where you are, Wildest Dreams 2? Great. Amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Now, would you look around just a second? Your obedience impacts others. Your faith, your trust impacts others. And I want to say to all of us here today, this is our time. You can be seated now. But to you guys, Wildest Streams 1 and Wildest Streams 2, I just want to say as the Apostle Paul said, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Guys, church, it's our turn. The generations have come to us. People were faithful in the Old Testament and people have been faithful now. And we're sitting here because of the sacrifice of a lot of people. But it's our turn now to take our next step. It's our turn now to be faithful to God. Every one of us, it's not an accident that you're here today. It's not an accident, you know, that God brought you to Rolling Hills at this time because God has a plan and a purpose for you. And the call on your life, the call on my life is to take our next step. Inside your worship, God, I want to ask everybody to pull one out. There's a card, a commitment card. And I want you to look at it with me. Now, this is an individual thing. Lisa and I have already talked. We prayed together, you know, as a couple. But, but we have to take a step individually. And this is an all skate, right? This is everybody all in, you know. So, so this is for everybody. And if you take that card out, we're asking everybody next week, next Sunday, to come and to bring this back to God. This is between you and the Lord. But as we grow as disciples, God's calling us to take a next step. So what does that look like for you? Reaching out. We, we asked everybody 2% of your time over the next 24 months to reach out. And maybe it's a Saturday serve. Maybe it's, you know, walking a meal over to a neighbor who's sick. Maybe it's going on a mission trip. Or maybe it's doing the PATH project and tutoring kids. Somehow, just don't make life about you and be self-absorbed. Somehow, give back. 14 days out of the next 24 months. You write it in because it's your personal commitment. What does that call for you? Growing up, growing up, what next step will you take? And maybe for you, it's baptism, right? Maybe for you, it's saying yes to Jesus. Maybe for you, it's being a member of the church. Maybe for you, it's doing the daily Bible reading, taking a daily step. Check that. Say, for the next 24 months, I want to read through the Bible. I want to learn more. I want to grow in my relationship with God. And then, the third one is giving all. If you're not yet tithing, I want to challenge you and encourage you. It's giving your first 10% back to God. I mean, it's like Christianity 101. It's the basic, right? God, you're first in my life. You're first in my finances. I trust you. But then next week, would you do a one-time gift and a 24-month pledge that we can make a difference in the next generation and the people around us in our community and in the world? Would you do that together? Next week, we're going to come. We're going to bring this back. You're going to tear off this, keep it, your commitment. And we're going to have an altar where we bring this and give it to the Lord. So this morning, I want us just to pray. I want to call us to a time of prayer. All around the room, there's tables that are set up, and we're going to share communion together. And just as the people rejoiced, we're going to rejoice. If you're one of the A6 leaders who's going to help serve communion, if you want to move to the tables right now, I want to invite you to go ahead and do that. We have 90 men here at Rolling Hills who have taken their next step to be servant leaders, to minister to the body. And they serve communion. They pray for all the prayer requests that come in. That they will help in any way that's needed. They'll visit hospitals. But guys, this is all of us. And just as the Passover was that defining moment for them, communion's that time for us. A time to remember God's faithfulness in our lives. How God has been so good to us. How God has blessed us. The gift of salvation. The gift of food, of resources. But also a time of commitment. A time to see that God gave his son who gave his all for us. And are we willing to give back to him? Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body. This is my body broken for you, personal for you. After supper, he took the cup. He said, this is my new covenant. You were under the old covenant. When you sinned, when you messed up, you were separated from God. You were done. You blew it, right? 
But there's a new covenant now, a covenant of grace. Woo, praise God. A covenant of grace, a covenant of mercy, a covenant of love. Take and drink in remembrance of me. For when you eat this bread, you drink this cup. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so as we move into this time of prayer, this time of worship, this is for you. Individually, that you would come to the table, that you would break off a piece of the bread. I want you to listen as it breaks. Christ's body broken. To dip into the cup, his blood poured out for you and to receive the gift. And then I want you to just find a place, pray. Maybe you're at your seat. Maybe it's with your spouse, with your family. What is your next step? What's God calling you to do? As we lock arms together, as we go forward together, a time of remembrance, a time of commitment. Let's pray together. Father God, here we are. We're your disciples. God, we are so in love with you. We are so grateful, God, for your work in our lives. It doesn't mean that everything's easier, everything is perfect, but one day it will be. (laughs) But for now, (laughs) you are faithful and you are with us and you're calling us, God, to go forward. You're calling us to take our next step, to trust, to follow. And so, God, we do. And we come right now as we step out and we come to your table and we receive the grace and the mercy that only you could give. And we're reminded that you gave all for us and we're challenged to commit all to you. So thank you, God, for your presence this morning. Thank you, Father, for your word and for worship. And right now, God, we respond as your people today in our day, in our generation, for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we come. Amen.